All right, we're going to go to our next speaker, Rabbi Shmuley Boteach. Um, Rabbi Shmuley, who the Washington Post and Newsweek call the most famous rabbi in America, stands among the world's most recognizable and passionate voices on values, spirituality, and relationships. He's an international best-selling author of over 30 books and has received multiple awards for his international work in Sedek. And I recently had the pleasure of seeing him at Mar-a-Lago. Um, and we also met in Israel, so amazing. And I please welcome him to the stage. Till today, cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. And I'm proud to be an American. At least I know I'm free. I'm not speaking, I'm only singing. This is it. This is as much as you're gonna get from me today. And I won't forget the men who died. And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me. Two weeks ago, not even two weeks ago, I traveled to Europe for the second time in a month to be at the 75th commemoration of the D-Day landings on the American beaches of Omaha and Utah. Omaha sustaining the largest number of casualties. Sword, Juno, Gold, the Canadian and British beaches. I had been there Two weeks before that, with my 13-year-old son, we were on our way back from Romania, where we had traveled for the 75th anniversary of the deportation of Elie Wiesel, the world's most famous Holocaust survivor, from Siget, Romania, via Kozice, Slovakia, to Auschwitz, where he would later, where he experienced everything that he would put down in his book, Night. What a contrast. A death camp where 10,000 people were incinerated every day. And after I took my son, David Chaim, he's 13, for the second time to Auschwitz in his young life, I had to show him the American military cemetery at Normandy because he had to know that when evil triumphs, as Martin Luther King said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That ultimately, there is justice. But God selects only certain instruments to carry out that justice. And the question of this conference now is whether you will choose to be one of those instruments. The 10,000 men who are buried with crosses and mug and davids at Normandy Cemetery, they were instruments of God's righteous justice to put an end to the greatest mass murder in the history of the world. We have no concept of what the Holocaust was. We can't imagine how between 1941 and 1945, after the Wannsee Conference that takes place in a suburb of Berlin on the 20th of January, 1942, chaired by Reinhard Heydrich himself, one of the three most evil men that has ever walked the earth, we have no concept of how they decided to fill 10,000 people's Lungs every day with poison gas. That's three 9-11s a day. The United States went to two wars after one 9-11. This is three 9-11s a day for four years. And I wanted my son to see the people who stopped it. The righteous, majestic United States of America. <laughs> which just last week was accused by a congresswoman of the United States of running concentration camps. And I want you to understand the seriousness and the magnitude of the accusation that the liberators of the camps have now become the perpetrators of the camps. And this does not mean that there isn't a humanitarian crisis on the U.S.-Mexico border. There is. The United States is the land of the free and the home of the brave. 
And there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people who want to come into this country because of its economic opportunity, because of its freedoms of conscience, of, of congregation, of, of religious worship. There are many people who are escaping horrid situations in their countries. And we don't know how to fully process the number of people who want to come into this country because of its greatness. Not because it's the Third Reich, because of precisely the opposite. And do you know what happened when a congresswoman of the United States sat back on her couch all of 29 years old, which is a good thing, she's not much older than many of you sitting here today, sat on her couch and did a live, a live stream on Instagram and said America is running concentration camps. Do you know what happened? Absolutely nothing. Almost nobody cared. There were a few protests. So I sat there and I said to myself, I've just come from the 75th commemoration of D-Day. I walked among the graves of the American men and women who gave their lives to stop the abomination of Hitler. Now I have someone in the Congress saying the United States is using concentration camps. An absolutely loaded Holocaust term. And she then doubled down and said, never again. Never again is not a political slogan. Never again is a sacred promise on the part of the Earth's inhabitants to forever combat genocide and at the very least, never belittle it. <clears throat> and I decided there and then that we would take out this ad, which appeared in Saturday's New York Times. We didn't want to get too graphic. These are human beings that are depicted in pictures of the Holocaust. We put a picture of people being liberated. Then we put a picture of Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And then we gave a little snippet of what the Holocaust was. I'm only going to read one paragraph to you. Jews were hunted from their homes and herded into squalid, disease-infested ghettos where hundreds of thousands died of illness and starvation. Their decomposing carcasses left to rot on the streets of Warsaw and Łódź. Those who survived were herded into cattle cars for journeys lasting days with almost no food and with a single bucket into which to defecate. The lucky ones who somehow survived this hellish journey were brought to Nazi concentration camps like Auschwitz, Majdanek, where they were subject to a selection by a white-gloved wearing doctor of the SS. Most were dead within 90 minutes upon arrival. The rest were subject to slave labor, hanged, shot, subject to live medical experiments. Their emaciated bodies, crawling with lice, surrounded by the stench of death and ash from the ever-burning crematoria. That is the Holocaust. To accuse the United States of something similar is itself an abomination. Do you know why she got away with it? She got away with it. Don't point a finger at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Point a finger at yourself. We allowed it to happen because we are not fighters. Because there's a battle happening with the United States and we are not fighters. Let me just tell you something. We Jews, to allow the desecration of the Holocaust by elected officials of the United States, I want to ask you a simple question. Had she said that what's happening on the ICE detention centers on the U.S.-Mexico border, had she said, these are plantations and worse, had she said, these are slave ships, slave ships where beautiful African children were put into shackles and transported across, Amer across the Atlantic for a life of slavery, most of them died in the journey. If she had called these camps slave ships, other groups in their righteous indignation would say, we're not saying there isn't a humanitarian crisis on the border, but don't play a game of one-upmanship with our suffering. Don't belittle what our community's experience has been. But we in the Jewish community, astonishingly, were not engaged in the fight. And the only question before you honestly at this conference is, to fight or not to fight? Not to fight gratuitously, 
not to fight for the sake of glory or victory. We Jews have never believed in that. We are the ones who gave the world. Isaiah, Zechariah, Jeremiah, who said the time would come when men would beat their swords into plowshares, when there would be everlasting peace, when no man would teach us on the art of war. We do not believe in fighting for the sake of fighting. We believe in harmony. We believe in universal brotherhood. We fight for right. We fight for what's right. And will you take the path over the next decades in your lives where what's most important to you is working at some investment bank, starting some internet startup, engaging in the endless game of accumulation that grants status, whether for guys, it's women who like them, whether it's women, it's feeling attractive, whether it's being at the center of an ever-expanding circle of possessions, or will your identity come from being engaged in the virtuous fight and the struggle for what's right? 75 years ago, <laughs> 75 years ago, a young man your age, in his early 20s, I know some of you are teenagers, there are some 20-year-olds here, a young man, 23 years old, got up on one of the last nights of his life. It happened to be the second night of Passover. It was 1943, April 1943. And he gave one of the great speeches of modern Jewish history. And he said, when Moses was on the last day of his life, he spoke the book of Deuteronomy and he famously told the Israelites gathered before him, today, I put before you life and death, and I enjoin you, I command you to choose life. But this young 23-year-old said something radically different. He said, today, I put before you death and death. All of you 700 fighters standing before me will surely die. The only choice left to you is how you will die. You will either die as victims who were brutalized and slaughtered by the SS monsters who are about to attack us, or you will take some of those bastards with you and make sure that your lives were led with dignity and you died as free men. His name, Mordechai Nalevich. Title? Commander, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Field of Battle, Central Eastern Europe with 10,000 Jews who have been gassed every single day. Now, could you imagine that that choice is not foisted upon us as young Jews? That living in the freest, greatest country in the history of the world, we have the choice every day, not between life and death, and certainly not between death and death, but between life and life. What kind of life will you live? Will you live the kind of life where for the first time in American history, lawmakers spewing anti-Semitism, elected officials, I'm not talking about the, the right-wing white supremacist neo-Nazi scum. And I'm not talking about left-wing, radical, anti-Semitic, pro-BDS, or Islamist terrorists who want to slaughter us. I am talking about elected officials of the United States. Getting up in speeches unheard of in the greatest country the world has ever seen and saying, this is another one of our ads, Blah, blah, the Jews control the whole world with their money, blah, 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 blah. There is a congresswoman from Minnesota who is spewing not just the ideas of the protocols of the elders of Zion, but the actual language of the protocols of the elders of Zion. When we took out this full-page color ad in the Washington Post, you know what we wanted to do? We didn't want to just trace Elon Omar's 
attacks against the Jews for being traitorous to the United States, dual loyalty, something Rashida Tlaib also accused us of. We didn't want to just trace her accusation that we Jews use our money to buy politicians. That we're these blood-sucking parasites who use our money to sponge off other people and use our cash to get to achieve some kind of international control, which is the protocols. We wanted to actually trace the language she was using. So what she did, so Elon Omar said, it's all about the Benjamins, baby, right? Sorry, let me start with this one. Israel hip has hypnotized the world. This is after the, the, the 2012 Gaza War. Israel has hypnotized the world. Israel, a tiny little righteous democracy. You know, I work very closely with a lot of LGBT organizations. The, the largest L gay pride parade in the world is going to take place this coming Sunday in New York City. Israel just appointed an LGBT, an openly gay right-wing minister named Amir Ochano, who's a close friend of our families. Imagine that happening in any of Israel's neighbors. Imagine. I mean, it would happen. He'd be shot and killed and hanged in the same day. And yet we have all these left-wing groups who oppose Israel. So Elon Omar actually said that Israel has hypnotized the world. And I said to myself, hypnotized the world? That's weird. Like, wh Where did that language come from? So we had someone research and actually read the Protocols of the Elder Zion. I don't know if any of you have actually read the Protocols of the Elder Zion, the most anti-Semitic tract of the modern world. And you know what it says there? The Jew hypnotizes by his daring, it hypnotizes the world by his daring the strength of his mind. Pretty darn similar, huh? Or the accusation that we Jews, it's all about the Benjamins. What does it say in the International Jew, which was published by the anti-Semite Henry Ford? Money is the only means the Jew knows by which to gain position. Same argument. We've heard all this garbage before. And finally, I want to talk about the political influence in this country that says it's okay to push for allegiance to a foreign country. This is straight from the White Man's Bible, 1981, famous anti-Semitic manif manifesto. The Jew is frantically, eternally loyal to the Jewish race and since 1948 to Israel. We cannot have any loyalty to the United States. The Jews who fight for the U.S., who are patriots, who stand up for the U.S., it's all a game we play to gain control of the United States. This wasn't said by someone from the Klan. This was said that the Jews have outside political influence for Israel. This was said by a member of the United States Congress. To complete the trio, <laughs> this is an ad we took out two weeks ago. Full page, the New York Times. Do you remember this? This quote was so unbelievable and because Rashida Tlaib said she was being misquoted, we decided to publish the entire quote. Because the New York Times said to us, you're going to quote out of context. So we told, I told the New York Times advertising department and the legal department, then we'll put in the entire quote. For those of you that know advertising, that's not a good ad because you don't want to put in an entire quote. It's too verbose. But to meet New York Times advertising standards, we put in the entire quote. She actually said this. Two weeks ago, we celebrated, or took a moment in our country to think about the Holocaust, we celebrated the Holocaust. And there's a kind of calming feeling. There's a kind of calming feeling I always tell folks when I think of the Holocaust. Rashida Tlaib receives a calming feeling when she thinks about the Holocaust. And why? Because her ancestors, the Palestinians, they lost their land for these Jews who came from Europe, had no claim to the land. Forget Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Forget the New Testament that only... I mean, Jesus, of course, was a Palestinian, as you well know. <laughs> so we Jews came straight out of the Holocaust in order to take the Palestinians' lands. And she gets a comforting feeling because it was her ancestors that gave the Jews their land. But the Jews, of course, stabbed them in the back and then stole their land, etc., et blah, 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 blah. And we took out the sad. Rashida Tlaib deceives America. Because the sad history, of course, is the exact opposite. The the leader of the Arabs in British-mandated Palestine was Haj Amin al-Husseini. He was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He was not only a Nazi collaborator, Hitler granted him sanctuary after he led a revolt against the British. They tried to arrest him. He fled to Nazi Germany. That's him and Hitler together. He was put on a stipend by Hitler. He lived out his years of the war in Nazi Germany in Berlin in a villa. You can't make this stuff up. Which leads me to this very important point. My friends, 
Jewish values are not about being more pro-Jewish and less pro-Islamic. It's not about n looking down at the atheist or the agnostic and believing that the theist is somehow superior. Jewish values are about finding the spark of God in every human being. You can't be a Jew and be a racist because it contravenes the very first chapter of Genesis that says that God created all humankind in his image. That every human being is of infinite value. Do you think that it was coincidental that Martin Luther King, perhaps the greatest American orator of the 20th century, used the Hebrew Bible as a liberation manifesto to fuel the civil rights movement from Isaiah, Zechariah, Jeremiah, Micah. To be a Jew is to stand up for every life and to fight tyranny and to know how to hate and oppose evil. And you know what scares me? It's that people on the left today, they no longer hate evil. They excuse evil. They find a million reasons. If a Palestinian blows himself up on a bus in Tel Aviv, and my God, I remember the horrible years of the early 2000s when a bus was being blown up every single day and we were telling our daughter who lives in Israel, take taxis, whatever it costs. There was always some excuse. In Israeli army, checkpoint was the reason. Economic deprivation was the reason. There was always some reason for someone to become evil. We look at Hitler's psychology today. How was he treated by his father, his mother? Evil is not something we are ever born with. We are all born innocent. Blank slates. And it's only the choices you make in your life that will determine whether you're good or evil. Good or evil and it's action that, ca that counts. Hamai suhoyikar. You know, I was on the Greg Gutman show on Fox a few months back. Greg I'm sorry, Greg Gutfield's show on Fox. Late one night, it was a Saturday night, it was after Shabbat. And I was on with a famous imam, and he says, you know, President Trump is the biggest Islamophobe. President Trump hates Muslims. He's a Muslim hater, he's a disgrace. And he went on and on about how horrible President Trump and his values are. I waited for him to finish. I wanted to be very respectful, and I said, Imam, may I just say, respectfully, that while you call President Trump a complete Islamophobe, and as you accuse him of hating Muslims, the world watched 500,000 innocent Muslim children bombed to death, 500,000 Arabs and many tens of thousands of Muslim children bombed to death and then gassed to death with poison mustard gas poison sarin gas and President Obama who you praise and who you love went to the world and said Bashar Assad if you gas Muslim children that's a red line it was amazing that the rest of it wasn't a red line that you could slaughter people with impunity but if you use mustard gas it's a red line in a moment we watched innocent Arab children frothing at the mouth In Aleppo, to Damascus, President Obama went to whom? To whom? To Vladimir Putin. And he said, let's do a deal with the Syrians to get rid of their weapons of mass destruction. And, us, and Putin said, it's done. Assad has destroyed all his weapons of mass destruction. And then President Obama, who loves the Islamic community, when he watched innocent Muslim children gassed to death, and who understands gassed to death better than the Jews? He did absolutely nothing. But when President Trump watched those same children gassed when he became president, three months into his presidency, he was at Mar-a-Lago. He was meeting with the Chinese president. He fired 59 Tomahawk missiles at Bashar Assad's air force that had carried out the strikes to make a statement. You will never use poison gas against Arab or Muslim children or anyone else while I am the President of the United States. And when I debated this point with my dear friend Brett Stevens, the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, 
a few months ago. Brett said to me, what does that prove? It was a pinprick. They say that Assad's airfields were up and running the next day. I said to him, in the last few months that Eli Wiesel was alive, I was with him. And I said to him, Rebbe Eliezer, when you were an inmate at Auschwitz, did you want Roosevelt, did you want the Americans, the British, the Allies to bomb the Auschwitz death camp? Because they had bombed the IG Farben plant, which was Auschwitz too. So they knew exactly what Auschwitz was, they just didn't bomb it. He said, of course I wanted to, to bomb it. Then I said, but, but, but you would have died. Had they bombed Auschwitz, you would have died. And he said something to me that I will never forget. He said, I would have died. But I would have died knowing there is justice in the world. I would have died knowing there is justice in the world. The question before each and every one of you is, will you be an instrument of justice? Will you belittle atrocities, genocide and mass murder? by calling detention centers, which we have to fix, absolutely have to fix, because America has to treat everyone in the best possible way. But will you trivialize mass murder and genocide? Compounding the injustice, could you imagine what AOC's words, the pain they caused Holocaust survivors and second generation, do you know how traumatized the Jewish community is by the Holocaust? And then to hear this, that it's not much worse than what's happening on the U.S.-Mexico border. Will you be instruments of justice when you hear that Iran, and by the way, notice that AOC has never condemned Iran for real genocidal threats against the Jewish people, and yesterday with 500 Iranian parliamentarians chanting publicly, death to America. That's where it really applies. Where Khamenei, who was sanctioned by President Trump today, regularly threatens the Jews with a second Holocaust. And I want to tell you, I was in February of this year in Warsaw, Poland, in a room not much larger than this, with Vice President Mike Pence speaking during lunch. And I had shivers that went down my spine. I had, my head was going to explode, this head with a beard and a yarmulke, part of a vulnerable nation who has seen 2,000 years of persecution as the second most powerful man on earth, got up at the Warsaw Summit. And I traveled all the way there, and he got up and he said, Iran is planning a second Holocaust. And for the first time ever, an American official used those words about Iran. Not genocide, not annihilation, not we're going to destroy Israel, not Israel's a cancer, not Israel's a tumor. We had heard all of that. But Mike Pence got up and said, Iran is planning a second Holocaust. The United States will never allow it. That, my friend, that, my friends, is power. That is justice. That is righteousness. We have waited so long. We waited through the three years of negotiating the Iran nuclear agreement where an eloquent president, the first African-American president, who seems in every aspect of his personal life to be a man who is righteous and committed, and he didn't have a father in his life, and he's become the father to his daughters that they didn't have, and he's impressive in every way, and there's nothing corrupt about him. But when it came to seeing evil, he not only couldn't point a finger at it and condemn it, he funded it. Gave them $150 billion. If you want to know how much money that is? Israel gets $3.7 billion a year. That's the biggest recipient. Of, it would take Israel 40 years to get what Iran got. And when people say, but it was their money. No, it's not. It's the money that belongs to the Iranian people, not to the mullahs, the thieves, the religious charlatans, the religious fakers who run that country whose invocation of God's name is a disgrace because they don't believe in the God of the Ten Commandments, do not murder. They believe in their, in, in their warped understanding of God who commands them to murder. That is the difference, my friends. Will you be agents of justice to uphold the value of every human life? And that's ultimately what politics is about. More than anything else, politics is about establishing the infinite dignity of the human person. Great countries do that. That's why they let their citizens speak, because every opinion matters. That's why they let their citizens vote, because every vote matters. And governments who do the opposite, they are about 
trivializing the value of life, making light, rendering each of you insignificant. And that's why we're opposed to big government. The bigger the government, the smaller the person. The, the bigger the person, the smaller the government. We want people to have a voice. We want people to express their convictions and their values. We want people above all else, and this is the most important of all Jewish values, to exercise choice. Judaism is about the supremacy of choice. That's why free nations trust their citizens to choose, and oppressive nations never trust their citizens. They brutalize them into forcing that choice on them. Long live freedom, my friends. Long live the United States of America. Long live the great servicemen and women of the United States of America. Long live those who speak out for six million victims and death to tyranny and death to any form of dictator who seeks to quash people and slaughter them wholesale. God bless you and God bless America. Now, I don't know if we have any time for questions. We do. Okay. I'm going to get back to singing for a few minutes, if you don't mind. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Thanks, Mr. Workin. Um, I just came back from Poland. Uh, I did a study abroad class where we uh, traveled to uh, uh, different Holocaust sites. Uh, we started in Krakow. We went up to Warsaw. Um, ironically, our, the nicest weather we had was in Auschwitz. Um, and when you were describing that uh, earlier, uh, that's the first time I've really sort of processed what happened. Um, I, I've been back in the U.S. for about a month now. Um, how do you propose that, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen that about 30% of American teens know what Auschwitz is or know what the Holocaust is. How do you propose we fight back against that beyond what you're doing, um, what we do on campus? H how do we get to kids in high school? Uh, because I, yeah. I know people from Poland and their eight-year-old son is going to start learning in a couple years about this. Look, for those of you who have uh, phones, after I speak, do this during the time allotted to the next speaker, please. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to jpost.com, you'll see that uh, in the top, in the, what do they call it? Hot, the most read op-eds. You'll see my op-ed right there about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez desecrating the Holocaust, and it starts with the latest statistics about knowledge of the Holocaust among American youth. And 22% of Americans don't know what the Holocaust is, young Americans. 64% haven't heard of Auschwitz. Now, why does it matter? Like, why did it matter? A lot of people said to me, you're going to spend all this money. We have to raise the money for these ads. They're very expensive. You're going to spend all this money to criticize AOC because she said the word concentration camps, doubled down, refused to apologize. Yesterday, she refused to go to Auschwitz, if you saw that. Uh, she was invited by a Holocaust survivor. Why did it matter? I'll tell you why it matters. We have all heard that those who forget history are destined to repeat it. Never again is a sacred promise to combat genocide. My fear is that in 30 years, especially once the Holocaust survival generation is gone and we're nearly there, God forbid, we're almost there, Auschwitz will be seen as a place where really bad things happen. You know, kind of the way Elon Omar described 9-11, she said, what did she say? Peop some people did some things. My fear is that the Holocaust is going to be just another, we admit the Jews suffered. Its uniqueness will be forgotten. Why does that matter to us? Because I'll tell you how many times it's happened since. First of all, the Armenians, two and a half million Armenians were slaughtered between 1916 and 1918. And by the way, to be a Jew is to stand up for justice always. I have two children who served in the IDF. I love Israel with all my heart. I spend a lot of my life defending Israel on the airwaves and print. But I've been publicly critical of Israel not for ru not recognizing the Armenian genocide. You know why Israel doesn't recognize the Armenian genocide or the U.S. government doesn't? Just down the block here in Congress, they don't recognize the Armenian government. The Trump administration also has to change their stance on the recognition. You know why they don't? Because there's a dictator, a brutal American-hating, anti-Semitic dictator in Turkey, brutalizing his own people. When I was in Istanbul, I couldn't get on Facebook and Twitter. He's such, he shuts down social media. We're afraid of angering him. But it started with the Armenians. 
And Hitler famously said, you know the book Hitler's Table Talk, where uh, Martin Bormann used to write down all of Hitler's mad ravings. Hitler used to have four-hour lunches most days. He would just be surrounded by his sycophants. And he famously said, when the Holocaust started, no one's going to care about the Jews. Who today talks about the Armenians? So, two and a half million Armenians killed 1916, 1918 under the cover of the First World War. Then six million Jews died in the Holocaust, murdered in the Holocaust. Then three and a half million Cambodians killed between 1975 and 1978 by Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Almost no one knows about that, except for the excellent film, uh, The Killing Fields. Was it Roland Joffe who made the film? Um, then the Rwandan genocide, 19 April 1994 to June 1994. This is the 25th anniversary. This June is when it ended. Fastest mass murder in the history of the world. No one cared about them because they were poor Africans with no oil, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody cared. And they died at a rate of 330 every hour. Low-tech killing. No gas chambers, no machine guns. They were macheted to death. The UN watched it and did nothing. The UN recalled. The UN took away the one. They had a few thousand soldiers under Gen General Romeo Dallaire, a French-Canadian, a great man. They took away his force. You know who did it, by the way? Kofi Annan. He wasn't even Secretary General of the UN at the time. He was the head of the UN peacekeeping forces. They took away his force. So the, the Hutus macheted the Tutsis to death. There were so many bodies in the rivers around Kigali, the, the capital, that their, the bodies be became a, a natural ford in the river. They dammed the actual river with bodies. And this is already in the age of television. Nobody cares. Then you have the, the, the former Yugoslavia, Srebrenica, Kosovo, until we have, of course, Darfur, and nobody cares. Mass murder, nobody cares. Because we are inured to the horror of it all. And by the way, that's why nobody cares about Syria either. One of the great humanitarian crises of our time. And these things transcend politics, by the way. So when you ask me what we have to do about it, we have to fight. If Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says something like that, we can't let her off the hook. A lot of people in the Jewish community said to me, look, she's not an enemy of the Jewish community. Let's win her over. Don't attack her. And I said, on any other issue, there would be leeway, but not this one. And the second reason, and by the way, we need to, we, I'll, t I'll tell you one personal thing because she happens to be here. My 21-year-old uh, daughter is sitting in the front row. Uh, she accompanied me here to Washington. Um, her name's Rachel Leah. And uh, we did a Holocaust tour, the likes of which, I don't know, most families probably have never done. For two summers in a row, I took my kids to almost every horrible Holocaust place in Europe. I'm not just talking about Auschwitz-Birkenau and Treblinka and Majdanek and Sachsenhausen and Mauthausen. I'm talking about Tikchin, villages where the Nazis, sorry, the Nazis came with the Einsatzgruppen right after the invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941 and just took everyone into the, a clearing in the, in, in the forest and shot everybody. We went, we went to the Bialystok where they took 2,000 Jews and put them into a shul and just burned them to death. And after a while, my we finally reached Budapest. And you probably know that the Hungarian Jews thought they were going to survive the Holocaust. Until uh, April of 1944, they were fine. And there were 600,000 Jews. Little did they realize, 800,000 Jews, I'm sorry, little did they realize 550,000 would die in two months. Auschwitz mostly murdered Hungarian Jews. And they, they, this, the SS set a record, 1944. They killed 40,000 Jews in a single day. We get to Budapest, and my daughter, Rachelea, says to me that she's leaving the trip. It's too much. And she said to me, why did you send me to seminary in Israel for a year? In Israel, I saw a living God, a living Jewish people. I saw the IDF protecting Jewish life. Europe is a giant Jewish graveyard. Why am I here? And I'll never forget the response that was given to Rachelea by her older sister, Shana. And, and my daughter, Rachelea, was saying to me, Tati, I believe in God. We're an Orthodox Jewish family. She said, I believe in God, but I'm very angry at God. I'm really questioning God. Why did you bring me here? And her elder sister said to her, you know why we came here? We did not come here to strengthen our relationship with God. We came here despite what it might do to our relationship with God. We came here for the six million Jews who don't want to be forgotten. Victims without a voice, you are their voice. That's why I'm so astonished. You know what I did after this, after this ad came out? So the ad came out on Saturday. I'm Shabbos observant, so I never know the reaction to our New York Times ads until Saturday night. This past Shabbos was the longest Shabbos of the year. It was summer equinox. 
So I had to wait till 9.30 in New York. I get on my phone. An avalanche of hatred hit me like it was like someone was clubbing me. I saw tens of thousands of tweets attacking me, calling me the most. Then we have a phone system. People leave messages. We're putting them together. We may give them to law enforcement. You have to hear the bile and the hatred and the anti-Semitism in these messages. How dare we attack AOC? It was an avalanche of hatred. I've, I've processed it for the past 24 hours. It keeps on coming. Someone in our office put together all the emails. I mean, tens and tens of pages of, of hatred. I don't regret one second of it. Not a second. Because, as I said, you know, Dennis Prager is speaking at the conference. What day is that? Dennis and I have been friends for 30 years, right? And he and I just spoke at Mar-a-Lago recently. And he made a very good point. I hope I'll make it to you directly. And tell him that I said he made such a good point that he should repeat it. He said, there's three kinds of people in the world. There are the fighters. And I never wanted to be a fighter. I'm a child of divorce. Many of you may know I write books on relationships, sexuality, child rearing. I was Oprah's marriage parent, parenting and relationship expert on the Oprah and Friends Radio Network for all of 2008. I did Oprah's TV show several times. Um, I had my own TV show on TLC called Shalom in the Home, Fixing Families. I, make love, not war. That's my motto. I never wanted to be a fighter. I said, there's no glory in fighting. You fight only because you have to uphold justice and uphold the value of human life. And we Jews especially are under global assault right now. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? But Dennis said there's three kinds of people. There are the fighters. Then there are those who support the fighters. For example, these ads, they're not paid for by themselves. Or, and then you have the innocent bystanders who watch, spectators. And the question is, which one will you be? But I'm telling you right now that after the Holocaust, and I've been to all these places, and I've now written a 600-page book about the Holocaust and about our trip. It has a strange title. It's called The Holocaust Holiday, One Family's Descent into Genocide Memory Hell. 600 pages. I want you to know that I am going to fight this new wave of anti-Semitism. I am going to fight this new wave of irrational Jew hatred. And it is deeply connected with hatred of the United States. Deeply connected. Do you, do you remember what happened to Israel a few years ago in the war, the 2014 war in Gaza? Israel was accused of having concentration camps. It was Israel who was being accused of mass slaughter of the palace. And now, you wait four or five years, it's always the United States. Now America is running concentration camps. The Jews are the canary in the coal mine. And America and Israel are intimately related in their value system. And Israel is the only democracy, the only free place, that little speck in the Middle East. What happens to Israel? The United States is a few years behind. Israel had all this terrorism against it, and the world turned a blind eye, excused it, economic deprivation, military checkpoints, and then one day, on September 11th, a clear blue day that I'll never forget, they flew planes into buildings that I used to frequent all the time, and 3,000 Americans and many internationals who were working in, in, were incinerated in jet fuel in a jet fuel fire inferno i have to tell you i'll end with this unless i should take one last question but i think i gotta end i have to end with this if you go to the jewish museum in warsaw you will see an original album which is probably in my opinion their most important artifact and the most grotesque i spoke about the warsaw ghetto uprising so himmler was so disappointed it was embarrassing the Wehrmacht being defeated by a bunch of Jews with no weapons, Molotov cocktails, a few broken pistols, barely any ammunition. So he chose his own general, a guy named uh, Jürgen Stroop. Stroop decides, the only way I'm going to defeat Mordechai Nalevich and, and, and uh, Pavel Frankel and all the heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto, who actually raised the Israeli flag. There was no Israel. They flew the Israeli flag over Warsaw. If you can only imagine that during, during, during the fighting. He sends Jürgen Stroop, and Jürgen Stroop decides, I'm going to burn the ghetto to the ground. That's the only way, because the Jews had now tunneled and, and burrowed deep under the earth. They had created these command centers. He burnt the entire ghetto to the ground. And he created a photo. He brought one of the best photographers, and he created a photo album, which he presented as a personal gift to Heinrich Himmler. The most famous picture of the entire Holocaust comes from that photo album. You know the picture of a little boy with his hands raised in the air? And there's the SS. That's from that photo album. And the original photo album sits now in Warsaw in this museum. 
You know what picture is there? There's a picture of Jews in midair jumping from the flames of the ghetto that was burning because Jürgen's troop had burned it to the ground. And as I looked at those pictures, what do you think it evoked in me? What pictures did it evoke in my mind? What was the cruelest thing about 9-11? What was the ugliest, most rancid thing about 9-11? It was the jumpers. People given that choice that Mordechai and Levit said, they knew they were not going to live. It was a choice between death and death, where they are going to die through incineration, 2,000 degree jet fuel fire inferno, or were they going to choose how they would die? There is nothing sadder on earth when you reduce a man or a woman to the simple, the only choice left is how you will die. And the reason we fight for freedom, the reason we fight for liberty, the reason we defend our troops, the reason that we try to build a, the most incredible economy to pay for all this stuff, which is why socialism doesn't work because it doesn't pay for it. We do all this to fight for freedom, not just for wall-to-wall carpets and not for central air conditioning and not for the latest Apple gadget. We're not materialists. I hate when they call us consumers. We do it because we believe in liberty. We believe in human life. We believe in freedom. My God, my God, how blessed we are. God bless America. And I won't forget the men who, who died, gave that-